Well, good morning. Good morning. Looking forward to a great day. Um, we're going to be studying, looking at some things in Joshua chapter 8. I got a chill this past week. Ted knows what those are. And I was looking forward to teaching that this morning until I started. Well, I, I knew what I was going to do. And I just got uh, kind of consumed with what I want to look at this morning for um, for Joshua. So we're going to look at um, the end of the end of chapter 8. Seems like we're... We're um, the last several studies. My goal is to cover a chapter, but you don't quite get through the, the chapter. So you do the end of one chapter, hoping to get through the next one, and you only get almost all the way through the next one. And we've done that like two or three times in a row. So we're going to make a clean break. We're going to finish chapter 8 this morning. Um, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for this wonderful day that we can come together and open up and study your word. We thank you for these living truths that... Uh, uh, will transform our lives, will we'll, we'll renew our minds and, and uh, put our focus on things above and not on things on this earth and, or the things of this world. Lord, we're so grateful and we thank you for the saints that are here and we just look forward to a blessed day, both in our Sunday school time and the morning service to follow. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last time we came down through chapter 8 and we kind of rushed through the end of of chapter 8 where there's where um, after the victory at Ai they build these two altars and I kind of I kind of came through those really quick and um, I said well you know I don't want to just gloss over them so I read them and really started thinking about uh, what was taking place here and there's really there's a reference back to the book of Deuteronomy um, where Moses tells Israel when you go into the land here's what I want you to do and so this is at a point in time where they've just had the victory. And because Moses gave them the instructions way back, before, you know, right before his death, Joshua and the, and the children of Israel, after this great battle, they fulfill what Moses told them to do. And as I was looking at these things, it really struck me that this is a, this is a, this is a very, very important time in the life of the nation of Israel. And it's very instructive to us. And I'm going to share a thought with you that, um, actually a couple of thoughts. I got, got, a, got another chill this morning as I was thinking about some things. You know, sometimes we, we know things, and then we think about a way to say it. That just kind of, you know, just takes that lens and in one statement turns it clear. This morning... Um, the first one I'm going to share with you here in, in Joshua chapter number 8, we're going to look at some things about the law and legalism that shows us and, and is showing Israel here a very clear lesson of how the law works in their life. And as I, as I was looking at this, it, it, it struck me that, and here's the statement, you know why right division is so important? Because you have to completely take the old program off the table if you're going to see the new program clearly. Because if you don't completely take the old program off the table, you're going to be thinking in terms and thinking in ways that are going to, going to not be consistent with the new program. You're going to be mixing them together. So you have to completely take the law program off the table to see the grace program. And then once you see the grace program, then you can put the law program back on the table and view the law program in light of the grace program. And boy, that's, that's, that's a way to say it. And what, what, what we see here in, in Joshua chapter 8, we see, and what I want us to do is I want to take the, take the grace program completely off the table, and I want to look at Joshua chapter 8 here and these two altars that are built and get a real clear picture of how the law worked with the nation of Israel and how God used the law to teach Israel. You know how the book of Galatians calls the law a, a schoolmaster, right? A teacher. What was the lesson of the law? The law was to teach the nation of Israel about sin and that they couldn't perform even though they thought they could and so therefore they would need a new covenant brought by their Messiah to bring them real spiritual life. And so we see here in Joshua chapter 8, 
this passage here and the reference back to what Moses told them is a real clear issue, a real clear presentation of just how legalism and how the law program works. You hear me use the term performance-based acceptance. God deals with the nation of Israel and back in time past under the law program on the basis of their performance, on the basis of what they did. When they did right, they got blessing. When they disobeyed and didn't do right, they got the curse. And those were direct interventions by God. We had, um, Sarah, by the way, is not going to be here this morning. She sent us a text. She's fine. She, I think she'll be here tonight but for, for whatever reason. We had a conversation last night or last week, and she asked a question that most people ask. Um, she, she was concerned about prayer life. and How, how do I pray now that I understand, understand the new program? And we went round and round, and, and, and finally she, she says, oh, it's an internal thing. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to explain to her, and she cut right to the chase and says, it's an internal thing. The other thing, the other little phrase I'm going to give you that I think is really neat, sometimes we talk about prayer and how God works and intervention. <coughs> the law program, God intervened directly, circumstantially, based on their performance. When they did good, God had blessing. They had victory. Like we, and we just, we're just seeing that with the illustration of Ai. Remember Israel, they had the great victory at Jericho? What happened at Ai? And it was a much smaller city. The re, why did they fail at Ai? Why did the nation get, get their britches beat at Ai? Because of one guy disobeyed the warning and the whole nation got the curse. That's the curse of the law based on performance. So what happens in chapter 8? After they, after they clean house, fix the thing, what do they, ha they have victory. Why? Because they took care of the problem. Remember the thing about the Valley of Achor? That place of judgment out in prophecy, we looked at this last time, in the book of Isaiah, God says, I'm going to take that place of judgment and make it a door of hope. A place where, you, where the future remnant is going to have to deal with the same thing, get right, deal with it, and that place of judgment is going to turn to a place of blessing. Anyway, that was, that was last week. Um, so what we're... Oh. Okay. It mentions several times uh, Achan. Achan. I'm not. I'm not sure your your question. Well, they, they put it. They put him and his cattle, family and everything. Yeah. You know, they stole him. They were yeah. carrying him. Mm -hmm. But another uh, part of the uh, Bible, they use that uh, Acor. The the Valley of Acor. Yeah. Acor. Acor. Yeah. Different purposes, but you know you can't really do that. First John right there. It, you know, blood of fields. You know, yeah. So. Well, when they when when the prophets refer to that place it would kick up the memory in Israel of the event of both Israel's sin and then Israel dealing with it and then gaining the victory right after that. That's the, that's the, value, of the, 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 the value of the Old Testament lesson. Anyway, here's the other little ditty. In time past, there was intervention where God would intervene physically and circumstantially. Today, God intervenes. Inner man. That little change of the way you pronounce the word will help you think about the way God works today. In time past in the law program, he intervened based on physically based on performance, the blessing and the curse. Today, he intervenes. It's an inner man thing. Does that make sense to you? Sure. So to me, that, that's, that's one of those little ways that you can make clear. And this passage here will, will demonstrate it. Now, um, you know the story. Joshua chapter 7, they had the defeat at Ai. God says it's Achan. 
and his family, he took the accursed thing, and Israel had the curse. Israel was cursed. Um, Joshua chapter 7, verse 12. Well, verse 11, Israel has sinned, they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have stole, also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed from among you. So there's the curse of the law. The law promised judgment for disobedience, and God was faithful to do that. And he says, if you want me to, if you want this thing to go forward, you've got to destroy the accursed thing. They do that. And then chapter 8, they have this wonderful victory at, at Ai, um, the ambush, where they take the whole, the whole army out, and they put a couple of regiments in one spot, and then they flee while they got 30,000 that then ambush the city. And then they turn and put the squeeze on the, on the men of Ai in between them and just beat their britches off in this great victory. It's after this great victory, which follows the defeat, that we have these two altars here in Joshua chapter 8. Let me show you. Verse, so you got the, they, had the, they had the victory. Ai, the king of Ai is, is hung on a tree and so on. Verse 30, 830. And Joshua built an altar unto the Lord of Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel as it is written in the book of the law of Moses an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. This is Mount Ebal. Then uh, in verse 32 uh, they write a copy of the law, the written law. Verse 33, And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side of the ark before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant as the, uh, of the Lord as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them. Half of, notice verse, the end, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded before they should bless the people of Israel. Notice the two mounts, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. All right, go back to the book. It says, as Moses had said. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Now, I got the map up here, and I wanted to leave it. You see the red line there? That's the, that's the journeying. They cross Jordan. We're in the book of Jericho. We're in the book of Joshua now. We have the. They, they defeated Jericho. They've had the final. They've had the, the defeat. Then the victory at Ai. And then there's these two mountains. There's Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Okay. In the in in the geography, that's about 15 miles, 15 to 20 miles, from this battle of uh, of Ai that they just conquered. So th but there's these two mountains here, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And Deuteronomy 11 is at the end of the first section of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is in two parts. The first 11 chapters, Moses talks to Israel about the past generation's failure. Mom and Daddy, they came out. But they, they died in the wilderness because of, because of unbelief, and now it's your opportunity to go in and possess the land. The first 11 chapters, Moses rehearses the failure of the previous generation. And you're at the end of that. Um, notice um, Joshua chapter number 7. Uh, no, chapter 9. Notice the perspective here. Deuteronomy chapter 9, Moses says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in and possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Notice, he says, you guys are getting ready to go in. And then he goes and, he's, and he gives them 
kind of a, a history lesson all the way through um, this first section. Um, go, to, uh, go to chapter 11, verse 1. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and keep his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. You know, and you know, ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, and his greatness, and his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles, and so on. Basically, I'm not talking to your kids. I'm talking to you guys. You guys saw what happened to mom and dad, the first generation that came out. You guys saw as children. This is the generation that saw as children the parting of the Red Sea and all that. So Moses now is, is putting them on notice. Verse 13, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Notice the if in verse 13. And if you, if you keep and hearken diligently, I'll give you the bless, blessings. Verse 16, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then, the what? The Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up heaven, that there be no rain, and the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Therefore ye shall lay up these my words in your heart. He's talking about the law here. So there's the blessing and the curse. Drop down to verse 22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. You see the if-then? That's the if-then performance of the law. Verse 24, every place... There on the soles of your feet shall tread, shall be yours. Here's the name it and claim it crowds verse. You know, we're going to walk around this church building and claim it for the Lord. You know, this is, this is where they get it. Verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the, the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. You see the blessing and the curse. This is the twofold. The, the law was a two-edged sword. It cut both ways. God was going to be faithful to bless or he was going to be faithful to judge based on what? What they did, their performance, their obedience. Verse 29 is the instruction. Now think of where you're at. you got the second generation. He's, he's telling them about mom and daddy and what they did wrong. And here's, here's, what you, here's the warning. Verse 29, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it. Stop right there. Where are we in the book of jo Joshua? They just went in, didn't they? They've just gone in. They've conquered Jericho. They've conquered Ai. At Ai, they've had the defeat and the victory. When you guys go in to possess the land, notice the middle of the verse, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan, by the way, where the sun goeth down in the land of Canaan, which dwell in the campaign over against Gilgal beside the plains of Moriah? There's those two mountains. He says, you put the curse, you put a curse on Mount Ebal, and you put a blessing on Mount Gerizim. Moses says, when you guys go in, this is what you do. So now, 
when we get over to the book of Joshua, they have just had a vivid illustration at Ai of the curse and the blessing. They've just had a demonstration of this principle of if you obey, I'll bless. If you don't obey, you get the curse. You follow? How, how clear that is? That's intervention, direct physical blessing, a blessing if you obey, and a curse if you don't. The curse is on Mount Ebal, the blessing is on Gerizim. Go to Deuteronomy 27. Once you turn into this half of the book, now, now Moses has taken this generation, he's warned them about the failures of mom and dad, what they did wrong, now the rest of the book of Deuteronomy is, here's what you do right. And he's challenging them now, and he's re-instructing this second generation, getting ready to go into the land under Joshua, here's what you do. Deuteronomy 27, and i got to be sure I, I get, this, get this right. Deuteronomy 27, um, verse 11. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, these shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you are come over Jordan. And he lists six of the tribes, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. Verse 13, and these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse. And he gives six more, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto the men of Israel with a loud voice, curse it. And the rest of the chapter there, it's curse it, curse it, curse it, curse it, curse it, curse it, curse it. Every single, every single verse almost begins with the word curse. And you just run, let your eye run down through there. You know what you see in the, in the law? You see more cursing than blessing. <laughs> you know why? Because there's more failure than obedience. Okay? So you see that. So now come to Joshua chapter 8. This is where we are with, and with Joshua. They've just gone in, and in Joshua's ears, the words of Moses are ringing. He says, we got some business we got to take care of. They just, had the, they just had the victory after the defeat at Ai. Verse 30, then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord of God of Israel in Mount Ebal. Ebal was the place where the curse was going to be represented. And they split the nation in half. They take half of the tribes and put them up on Mount Ebal. And there's an altar that's there that symbolizes God's faithfulness to curse when, dis when they disobey. And then they build an altar on Gerizim, and they put half of the, the tribes over there, and that's the place that demonstrates God's Bless uh, God's faithful to bless. Okay? And, and so that's what you see there. Um, verse 31, Moses, of the children, Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel. It's written in the book of the law of Moses. An altar of whole stones over which no man lift up any iron. And they offered thereon burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. That's on Gebel, where the curses were. Reminding God's judgment. They write a copy of the law, verse 32, verse 33, and all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side of the ark and on that side of the ark before the priests of the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant. What's in the middle? The ark. You got half on one side, half on the other side, and what's in the middle? God and his word and the ark. <laughs> okay? Um, half on the, uh, of them over against Mount Gerizim, the end of verse 33, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward, they read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. They rehearse. They rehearse. They have a scripture reading that probably lasts all day. <laughs> and here's something. My, my wife is back there, so we, you know, her 
head just popped up. Um, notice verse 35, there was not a word of all the, the Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of the children of Israel, the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. They didn't have a junior church service, but that doesn't mean we can't have one. Just point it. But what, what are the kids? The kids, see, you know, junior church is, it's to prepare kids to sit in with the adults and to sit under the teaching of God's word. So that's okay. But um, you, you just you see, see that here. Pete. The, uh, the strangers. Those are the people that, that joined Israel. These would be people like Rahab and her family and others that had, had joined the nation. There was provision for the strangers to join the nation. Ted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've had it, I've had that going on. See, nationalism is established to maintain national identity. Boundaries and culture and so on are to be preserved within the nation. It says in the book of Acts that they might seek the Lord. Internationalism is Satan's attack on God's design of nations and it's going to fit who's coming down the road later. Internationalism tries to bring everybody together under the same banner, right? So kudos to Ted for the, the, the little political wisdom. Yeah. Now that that is real clear how the law works, right? Blessing if you obey, curse if you don't. So we've taken the grace program off, we've seen how the law works. Now come to Paul. Go with me to the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter number 7. And I had to send out a second email this morning because I had a mistake in the first one I sent out last night, which is what, a, what almost always happens when I think I'm done early and send it out because I look at it again in the morning and see something I want to change. So the first mention of the body of Christ is here in Romans chapter 7. The first mention in the Bible. Now who's the body of Christ? It's something different, right? Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Wherefore my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. How? By the body of Christ. I'm I think he's talking there about the, the new man. You're a new people. Part of a new program. Guess what your relationship is to the law? You're dead to it. You see the separation there? The clear break because the law pertained to a different program and a different people and it worked differently. What's the problem with the What do we learn from Paul about the law? We can't keep it. Romans chapter 8. The, the law was weak. How? Through the flesh. There wasn't any problem with the law. The law was holy and righteous and just and good. Where's the problem? With me. See, I can't keep it. I can't perform. I can't do it. Why? Romans 7, verse 14. For I know that the law is spiritual. It's holy and just and good. He said that earlier up in verse 12. But I am carnal sold under sin. For that which I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. I, I do, do the things I shouldn't, and the law just is, is spot on. It contends me, condemns me. Verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it. But what? sin that dwelleth in me. Do you see how he just separated himself from his old sin nature? He says, I do the things that I shouldn't, but who's doing it? Sin in me. And it's not me. It's not the real me. Who's the real me? It's the new life I have in Christ. Follow? Um, verse 7 to 18. 
For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I just can't get over the hill to do it. See the emphasis on do, 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 do there? For the good that I would, verse 19, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, that is if I do the stuff I, don't, I shouldn't do, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. Do you see how he separates himself from the old sin nature? That's Romans 6, beloved. He says, what are we? We are dead to sin, because what did God do? He took our old man, our old nature, and nailed it to the cross with his son. We died with him. We're buried with him. And now we're raised to walk in what kind of life? Newness of life. She's got it. You got a smart kid there. New, new identity. New way to think of yourself. <laughs> I love that. No more I. Isn't that just what Galatians 2.20 says? Not I, but it's Christ. You know why it's not I? Because I can't. But he can. The issue is his life in me now. That's the whole issue. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Notice how he qualifies it. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. How, do you, how are you free from condemnation? You walk after the spirit. What happens if you walk after the flesh? Condemnation. Walking after the flesh is walking under the law. That's what he's just talked about. In my flesh is no good thing. I can't do it. So if I'm focused on the flesh, guess what I have? Condemnation and frustration and guilt and, <coughs> oh, wretched man that I am, oh, pity party. Right? Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus... As Romans 6, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Why am I free from the law of sin and death? Because he took the law away. And now I have new life, and that's where I live, and that's where I function. Why? Verse 3, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. What couldn't the law do? Make me righteous couldn't bring me into, into acceptance. All the law did was condemn me. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, see, the problem was me, not the law. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. See, I don't have to condemn myself. God already did it. You see that? Why did he do that? That, verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh under the old program but after the what? After the spirit. Where do we get the spirit? In the new program. And you know what the, what the, what the grace program does? The grace program gives us spiritual life and a new heart and forgiveness up front. When we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior we get it all, don't we? We get forgiveness, we get a new heart, we get a new life, and we get righteousness. God gives it to us up front. What about Israel back in the Old Testament? They didn't have it, did they? You know all they had back in the Old Testament? It was me, myself, and I. Their spiritual life came when? Out there in the future. Israel's new heart Israel's forgiveness, Israel's spiritual life, all was tied to their Messiah and the kingdom. So therefore, back in the old covenant, back in the, in the when, when God says, do this and I'll bless, and don't do that and I'll curse, they're basically on their own, aren't they? they their natural ability to just do the best they can 
in their human nature and human strength. Where are we? We have Christ in us. God gave us the life, gave us the blessing, gave us the righteousness, forgave us of all of our sins up front now. We possess spiritually what Israel has to wait for. And you know how he says you live and you function now today? On that intervention, <laughs> not the intervention program. See the difference? And it's, it, that's the way God works today. Why? Because he took that old program. Remember, we've got to take, if we're going to, if we're going to live in the new program, what do we have to do to the old program? We have to take it completely off the table to understand the difference. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. You want to go back under the old program, you're going back under a works-oriented program, a works and blessing program. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the what? The curse. You want to go back under that program? Then it's about you doing. And if, it's, if you're not going to live under the grace program, you're going to live under the law program, you're under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You, and see, this is where most Christian people think. They think in terms of doing, and then I get God's blessing. And if things are going bad in my life, if I get sick, or if I lose my job, or things just aren't going right, what's God trying to teach me? What God's trying to tell me? See, that's just what God did back in the Old Covenant. When Israel got sick, and Israel had defeat, and it didn't rain, guess what? They could say, the problem's with us. Because God says if we're, gonna, if we're doing it, all that stuff's going to come. We don't think in terms of what we do getting the blessing from God. We already have the blessing up front. Verse number 11, but as it is written, but, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For... The just shall live by what? By faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. How do we live today on the basis of faith? Faith in the old program or faith in the new program? We walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We take the law program off the table because we're the body of Christ now and we're dead to that old program. Why? Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. What did he do to that old covenant? He took, took its curse. He took its wrath. The book of Colossians says he nailed it to the cross. It was against us. It was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now we have a new situation and circumstance today, don't we? We walk in the spirit under the grace program, not in the flesh under the law program. And what happens when we, when we trust Christ as our personal Savior, we get spiritual life and blessing the moment we trust Christ as our Savior. Look at, go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to, be to you. Grace to who? The Gentiles and the body of Christ. <laughs> Blessed, verse 3, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where? In Christ. You get taken from, from Adam and put in Christ, what do you get? All spiritual blessings. Up front, when does Israel get their spiritual blessings? Out there in the kingdom. See how, how that works? Now, do we still live in the flesh? Absolutely. Do we have the struggle in the flesh? Absolutely. How do we get the victory? Going back under the old program, the do's and the don'ts and the lists and so on? No. We set that program aside and we walk in the spirit, in newness of life, newness of identity. When we mess up, oh God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. What does he say? I already did. Quit playing like Joshua. Get up off your, get up off your chest and be a man <laughs> and live like who you are. See that? <laughs> I'm not trying to make... So what, what's the issue now? We'll finish here. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Well, we already have forgiveness. We have inheritance. Now we just learn to appreciate it and build into our lives that truth of the new man and we grow because we have the mystery program. Look at Paul's prayer, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. After he's just talked about the mystery, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit, where? In the inner man. Because what's the outward man doing? The outward man perishes. But the inner man is renewed, what? Day by day. Has God promised to, to, to deliver this outer man here in the day of grace? No. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. He left us here in earthen vessels, but he put his life inside of it made us a new creature strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts how by faith where does faith come from faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God how does Christ dwell in us by faith as we by faith take the word of God believe it and apply it to our life it's not I but it's Christ that liveth. we make the conscious choice to put on that new man that new creature and walk in newness of life isn't that great now do we still mess up and stub our toe absolutely what do we do that isn't me it's no more I that do it what did that Sin did it. <laughs> so now I need, to, I need to put off that carnal mind and walk a new, renew our mind with sound doctrine and the truth of God's word. And then you know what we enjoy? We enjoy the fruits of righteousness. The Christian life is inside out. It's not intervention. It's intervention. And that produces fruit. And that produces life, doesn't it? And the choices we make now based on sound doctrine bear fruit in our lives. Relationships, personal habits, you know, lifestyles, all of that. Is, 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 our, is our walk important? Absolutely. When we say it's about the law was about doing, I'm not saying that good works don't matter. They're just produced in a different way. Amen? By the word of God rightly divided, working in us. I'll finish with this, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to what? We got some power inside of us. You know why? We got Christ in us. They didn't have it back in the old program. God works differently today. You have to take the old program off the table to see the new program clearly how God works today in our lives. Now we can put the old program back on the table 
and study it, right? Rightly dividing the word. Do you have a question? Ted. doesn't mean good works aren't important. It just means we don't pr we produce it with a different mindset. It frees, us up. it frees you up. Yeah. Instead of looking around, what is God trying to tell me with all this stuff happening to me? And I think he did this, and I think he did that. That's walking by sight, isn't it? Not by faith. And now, some of the things that happen in our life, we could say, you know, God did that. How did he do that? Through his word. Working in me or working in somebody else that I associate with. The body of Christ is important. And the life and the, and the support that we receive from other people is tremendous. But God works in a different way. It's not intervention. It's intervention with the renewed mind. Yeah, that was old flip. Yeah, the devil didn't make you do it. You 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 followed him right along. Anyway, okay. I hope that was helpful to you. I hope that was helpful to you because the that if then performance based thinking is just another form of legalism. Okay, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these wonderful truths. We pray that Christ would have more freedom to live his life in and through us. May we allow him access to our hearts and lives that he might change us. Lord, we thank you for the word of God that renews our mind and transforms us into the life that you would have us to live through your son. It's in Christ's name we pray.